The Followers It was six o'clock on a winter's evening. Thin, dingy rain spat and drizzled past the lighted street lamps. The pavements shone long and yellow. In squeaking galoshes, with Mackintosh collars up and bowlers and trilbies weeping, youngish men from the offices bundled home against the thistly wind. "'Night, Mr. Macy. Go in my way, Charlie. Oh, there's a pig of a night. Good night, Mr. Swan.' And older men, clinging on to the big, black, circular birds of their umbrellas, were wafted back up the gaslit hills to safe, hot, slippered, weatherproof hearths, and wives called mother, and old, fond, flea-bag dogs, and the wireless babbling. Young women from the offices, who smelt of scent and powder and wet pixie hoods and hair, scuttled, giggling, arm in arm, after the hissing trams, and screeched as they splashed their stockings in the puddles, rainbowed with oil between the slippery lines. In a shop window, two girls undressed the dummies. "'Where you going tonight? Depends on Arthur. Up she comes. Mind a cammy next, Edna?' The blinds came down over another window. A newsboy stood in a doorway, calling the news to nobody very softly. "'Earthquake! Earthquake in Japan!' Water from a chute dripped onto his sacking. He waited in his own pool of rain. A flat, long girl drifted, snivelling into a hanky, out of a jeweller's shop, and slowly pulled the steel shutters down with a hooked pole. She looked in the grey rain, as though she were crying from top to toe. A silent man and woman, dressed in black, carried the wreaths away from the front of their flower shop into the scented, deadly darkness behind the window lights. Then the lights went out. A man with a balloon tied to his cap pushed a shrouded barrow up a dead end. A baby with an ancient face sat in its pram outside the wine vaults, quiet, very wet, peering cautiously all round it. It was the saddest evening I had ever known. A young man with his arm round his girl passed by me laughing, and she laughed back right into his handsome, nasty face. That made the evening sadder still. I met Leslie at the corner of Crimea Street. We were both about the same age, too young and too old. Leslie carried a rolled umbrella which he never used, though sometimes he pressed doorbells with it. He was trying to grow a moustache. I wore a check ratting cap at a Saturday angle. We greeted each other formally. Good evening, old man. Evening, Leslie. Right on the dot, boy. That's right, I said. Right on the dot. A plump, blonde girl, smelling of wet rabbits, self-conscious even in that dirty night, minced past on high-heeled shoes. The heels clicked, the soles squelched. Leslie whistled after her, low and admiring. "'Business first, I said. "'Oh, boy,' Leslie said. "'And she's too fat as well. "'Oh, I like them corpulent,' Leslie said. "'Remember Penelope Bogan? A missus, too. "'Oh, come on, that old bird of paradise, Ally. "'How's the exchequer, Les? "'One and a penny. How are you fixed? "'Tanner. What'll it be, then? The compasses? "'Free cheese at the Marlborough.' "'We walked towards the Marlborough.' dodging umbrella spokes, smacked by our windy max, stained by steaming lamplight, seeing the sodden, blown scourings and street wash of the town, papers, rags, dregs, rinds, fag ends, balls of fur, flap, float and cringe along the gutters, hearing the sneeze and rattle of the bony trams, and a ship hoot like a fog-ditched owl in the bay. And Leslie said, "'What'll we do after?' "'We'll follow someone,' I said." Remember following that old girl up Kitchener Street, the one who dropped her handbag? You should have given it back. There wasn't anything in it, only a piece of bread and jam. Here we are, I said. The Marlborough Saloon was cold and empty. There were notices on the damp walls. No singing, no dancing, no gambling, no peddlers. You sing, I said to Leslie, and I'll dance, then we'll have a game of nap, and I'll peddle my braces. The barmaid with gold hair and two gold teeth in front, like a well-off rabbit's, was blowing on her nails and polishing them on her black marocane. She looked up as we came in, then blew on her nails again 
and polished them without hope. You can tell it isn't Saturday night, I said. Evening, miss. Two pints. And a pound from the till, Leslie said. Give us your one and a penny, Les, I whispered, and then said aloud, Anybody can tell it isn't Saturday night. Nobody's sick. Nobody hurt to be sick, Leslie said. The peeling, liver-coloured room might never have been drunk in at all. Here, commercials told jokes and had scotches and sodas with happy, dyed port and lemon women. Dejected regulars grew grand and muzzy in the corners, inventing their pasts, being rich, important, and loved. Reprobate grannies in dustbin black cackled and nipped. Influential nobodies revised the earth. A party with earrings, called Frilly Willy, played the crippled piano, which sounded like a hurdy-gurdy playing underwater, until the publican's nosy wife said, No. Strangers came and went, but mostly went. Men from the valleys dropped in for nine or ten. Sometimes there were fights, and always there was something doing, some argy-bargy, giggle and bluster, horror or folly, affection, explosion, nonsense, peace, some wild goose flying in the boozy air of that comfortless humdrum nowhere in the dizzy ditch-water town at the end of the railway lines but that evening it was the saddest room I had ever known. Leslie said in a low voice, "'Think she let us have one on tick?' "'Wait a bit, boy,' I murmured. "'Wait for it to thaw.' But the barmaid heard me and looked up. She looked clean through me, back through my small history to the bed I was born in, then shook her gold head. "'I don't know what it is,' said Leslie as we walked up Crimea Street in the rain, "'but I feel kind of depressed tonight.' It's the saddest night in the world, I said. We stopped, soaked and alone, to look at the stills outside the cinema we called the Itch Pit. Week after week, for years and years, we had sat on the edges of the springless seats there in the dank but snug, flickering dark, first with toffees and monkey nuts that crackled for the dumb guns, and then with cigarettes, a cheap special kind that would make a fire swallower cough up the cinders of his heart. Let's go in and see Lon Chaney, I said, and Richard Talmadge, and Milton Sills, and, and Noah Beery, I said, and Richard Dix, and Slim Somerville, and Hoot Gibson. We both sighed. Oh, for our vanished youth, I said. We walked on heavily, with willful feet, splashing the passers-by. Why don't you open your brolly, I said. It won't open. You try. We both tried and the umbrella suddenly bellied out, the spokes tore through the soaking cover, the wind danced its tatters, it wrangled above us in the wind like a ruined mathematical bird. We tried to tug it down, an unseen new spoke sprang through its ragged ribs. Leslie dragged it behind him along the pavement as though he had shot it. A girl called Dulcie, scurrying to the itch pit, sniggered, Hello! And we stopped her. A rather terrible thing has happened, I said to her. She was so silly that even when she was fifteen we had told her to eat soap to make her straw hair crinkle, and Les took a piece from the bathroom, and she did. I know, she said. You broke your gamp. No, you're wrong there, Leslie said. It isn't our umbrella at all. It fell off the roof. You feel, he said. You can feel it fell off the roof. She took the umbrella gingerly by its handle. There's someone up there throwing umbrellas down, I said. It may be serious. She began to titter, and then grew silent and anxious as Leslie said, You never know. It might be walking sticks next. Or sewing machines, I said. You wait here, Dulce, and we'll investigate, Leslie said. We hurried on down the street, turned a blowing corner, and then ran. Outside Rabiotti's cafe, Leslie said, It isn't fair on Dulce. We never mentioned it again. A wet girl brushed by. Without a word, we followed her. She cantered long-legged down Inkerman Street and through Paradise Passage, and we were at her heels. I wonder what's the point in following people, Leslie said. It's kind of daft. Never gets you anywhere. All you do is follow them home and then try to look through the window and see what they're doing, and mostly there's curtains anyway. I bet nobody else does things like that. You never know, I said. The girl turned into St. Augustus Crescent, which was a wide, lamp-lit mist. People are always following people. What should we call her? Hermione Weatherby, Leslie said. He was never wrong about names. 
Hermione was fey and stringy, and walked like a long gym mistress, full of love through the stinging rain. You never know. You never know what you'll find out. Perhaps she lives in a huge house with all her sisters. How many? Seven, all full of love. And when she gets home, they all change into kimonos and lie on divans with music and whisper to each other. And all they're doing is waiting for somebody like us to walk in, lost. And then they'll all chatter round us like starlings and put us in kimonos too. And we'll never leave the house until we die. Perhaps it's so beautiful and soft and noisy, like a warm bath full of birds. I don't want birds in my bath, said Leslie. Perhaps she'll slit her throat if they don't draw the blinds. I don't care what happens so long as it's interesting. She slip-slopped round a corner into an avenue where the neat trees were sighing and the cosy windows shone. I don't want old feathers in the tub, Leslie said. Hermione turned in at number 13, Beach View. You can see the beach all right, Leslie said, if you've got a periscope. We waited on the pavement opposite, under a bubbling lamp, as Hermione opened her door and then we tiptoed across and down the gravel path and were at the back of the house outside an uncurtained window. Hermione's mother, a round, friendly, owlish woman in a pinafore, was shaking a chip pan on the kitchen stove. I'm hungry, I said. Shh! We edged to the side of the window as Hermione came into the kitchen. She was old, nearly thirty, with a mouse-brown shingle and big, earnest eyes. She wore horn-rimmed spectacles and a sensible tweed costume and a white shirt with a trim bow tie. She looked as though she tried to look like a secretary in domestic films, who had only to remove her spectacles and have her hair cherished and be dressed like a silk dog's dinner to turn into a dazzler and make her employer, Warner Baxter, gasp, woo and marry her. But if Hermione took off her glasses, she wouldn't be able to tell if he was Warner Baxter or the man who read the meters. We stood so near the window... We could hear the chips spitting. "'Have a nice day in the office, dear. There's weather,' Hermione's mother said, worrying the chip pan. "'What's her name, Les?' "'Hetty.' Everything there in the warm kitchen, from the tea caddy and the grandmother clock to the tabby that purred like a kettle, was good, dull, and sufficient. "'Mr. Truscott was something awful,' Hermione said as she put on her slippers. "'Where's her kimono?' Leslie said. "'Here's a nice cup of tea,' said Hetty. "'Everything's nice in that old hole,' said Leslie, grumbling. "'Where's the seven sisters like starlings?' It began to rain much more heavily. It bucketed down on the black backyard, and the little comfy kennel of a house, and us, and the hidden hush town, where, even now, in the haven of the Marlborough, the submarine piano would be tinning daisy, and the happy, hennered women squealing into their port. Hetty and Hermione had their supper. Two drowned boys watched them enviously. "'Put a drop of Worcester on the chips,' Leslie whispered, and by God she did. "'Doesn't anything happen anywhere?' I said, "'in the whole wide world. "'I think the news of the world is all made up. "'Nobody murders no one. "'There isn't any sin any more.' or love, or death, or pearls and divorces and mink coats, or anything, or putting arsenic in the cocoa. Why don't they put on some music for us, Leslie said, and do a dance? It isn't every night they got two fellows watching them in the rain. Not every night, anyway. All over the dripping town, small lost people with nowhere to go and nothing to spend were gooseberrying in the rain outside wet windows. But nothing happened. I'm getting pneumonia, Leslie said. The cat and the fire were purring. Grandmother time tick-tocked our lives away. The supper was cleared, and Hetty and Hermione, who had not spoken for many minutes, they were so confident and close in their little lighted box, looked at one another and slowly smiled. They stood still in the decent purring kitchen, facing one another. There's something funny going to happen. I whispered very softly. It's going to begin, Leslie said. We did not notice the sour racing rain any more. The smiles stayed on the faces of the two still silent women. It's going to begin. 
and we heard Hetty say in a small, secret voice, "'Bring out the album, dear.' Hermione opened a cupboard and brought out a big, stiff-coloured photograph album and put it in the middle of the table. Then she and Hetty sat down at the table side by side, and Hermione opened the album. "'That's Uncle Elliot, who died in Puthcall, the one who had the cramp,' said Hetty. They looked with affection at Uncle Elliot, but we could not see him. "'That's Martha the wool shop. You wouldn't remember her, dear. It was wool, wool, wool with her all the time. She wanted to be buried in a jumper, the mauve one, but her husband put his foot down. He'd been in India. "'That's your Uncle Morgan,' Hetty said, one of the Kidwelly Morgans. Remember him in the snow?' Hermione turned a page. "'And that's Mavanwi. She got queer all of a sudden, remember? It was when she was milking. "'That's your cousin Jim, the minister, until they found out. "'And that's our Beryl,' Hetty said. "'But she spoke all the time like somebody repeating a lesson, "'a well-loved lesson she knew by heart. "'We knew that she and Hermione were only waiting. "'Then Hermione turned another page, "'and we knew by their secret smiles "'that this was what they had been waiting for. "'My sister Katinka,' Hetty said. "'Auntie Katinka,' Hermione said. They bent over the photograph. "'Remember that day in Aberystwyth, Katinka?' Hetty said softly. "'The day we went on the choir outing. "'I wore my new white dress,' a new voice said. "'Leslie clutched at my hand. "'And a straw hat with birds,' said the clear new voice. "'Hermione and Hetty were not moving their lips.' I was always a one for birds on my hat, just the plumes, of course. It was August the third, and I was twenty-three. Twenty-three come October, Katinka, Hetty said. That's right, love, the voice said. Scorpio I was, and we met Douglas Pugh on the prom, and he said, You look like a queen today, Katinka, he said. You look like a queen, Katinka, he said. Why are those two boys looking in at the window? We ran up the gravel drive and around the corner of the house and into the avenue and out on to St. Augustus Crescent. The rain roared down to drown the town. Then we stopped for breath. We did not speak or look at each other. Then we walked on through the rain. At Victoria Corner we stopped again. Good night, old man, Leslie said. Good night. I said, and we went our different ways.